Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, Chapter 9, In the Rose Bush. When Mrs. Frisbee got home, Teresa, Martin, and Cynthia were eating supper. And she had told them what she had already told them what to do if it got dark before she returned. Coming silently down the tunnel, she could hear them talking in the room below, and she paused a moment to eavesdrop on their conversation. Obviously, Cynthia had been worrying, and Teresa was reassuring her. She couldn't have gotten back sooner than this, Cinny. Don't you remember? The crow said it was a mile to the tree. It might even be farther. Yes, but crows fly so fast. But if he went two miles high, that was Martin, it would be three miles altogether. And that's just one way. Six, said Teresa, two up, two down, one to get there and one to get back. That's right, no wonder she isn't back yet. But what about the owl? You know how owls are. It was still light when they got there. He couldn't see. But it's dark now, said Cynthia. Oh, I wish she'd come back. I'm scared. Not so loud, Teresa said. Timothy will hear. I'm home, called Mrs. Frisbee, hurrying the rest of the way down. And now it appeared that they had all been worried, for they all ran to her, even Martin, who ordinarily avoided such displays, threw his arms around her. Oh, mother, said Cynthia, near tears. I was so worried. Poor Cynthia, it's all right. How high did you fly? Asked Martin, recovering quickly. High enough so the trees looked like bushes, the garden looked like a postcard, and the river like a snake. Did you see the owl? What did he say? I saw him. Later, I'll tell you all about it. First, I want to see Timothy. How is he? Why didn't you move his bed down here? Teresa said, I wanted to, but he said he'd rather stay in bed. I think he's feeling worse again. But when Mrs. Frisbee went to see him, she found him sitting up and his forehead felt not at all feverish. I'm all right, he said. I stayed in here because I wanted to think about something. Think about what? About moving day. Moving day? Why? What about it? Had he, after all, overheard her talking to the others? Heard about her flight to the owl? But no, he was explaining. I hadn't been outdoors since I got sick, so I don't know what it's like. I mean, the weather. But today, this afternoon, I noticed something. What was it, Timothy? A smell in the air, a warm, wet smell. If you sniff, you can still smell it, though it's not so strong now. Mrs. Frisbee had noticed this, of course, both indoors and outdoors. It's the smell of the frost melting, Timothy went on. I remember it from last year, and after that, it wasn't long until we moved. Mother, when are we going to move this year? Oh, not for a long time yet, said Mrs. Frisbee. Miss Frisbee tried to sound as casual as she could. It's still much too cold and too early to think about it. I have to think about it, said Timothy. He sounded serious, but calm and unworried. Because if it comes too soon, I don't know if I can go out. I tried walking a little bit today and here when the others were outside. Timothy. You're supposed to stay in bed. You'll make yourself sick again. I know, I know, but I had to find out. And I couldn't walk much. I couldn't. I only went a few steps and I got so dizzy, I had to lie down again. Of course you did. You haven't really recovered yet. I guess I haven't. That's why I wanted to think. Timothy, you must not worry about it. That will only make you worse. I'm not worried. 
I thought I would be, but I'm not. What I really think about is how nice it is in there in the summer beside the brook. And it's true, I want to go. When we moved, I want to go to our new house, but I'm scared. But then I'm not scared. I was afraid you might be, or, or maybe you would think I was, but that's what I really wanted to tell you. I'm not scared. I, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. So you shouldn't worry about it either. Mrs. Frisbee realized that he had somehow switched their positions. He had somehow seen the danger he was in, guessed somehow that moving day was near, and somehow he knew that he was very likely to die. And yet here he was, reassuring her. She wanted to tell him about the owl and the rats and tell them that there was something that might still be done but she decided she had better not. She didn't really know if they could help and it would be better to wait until she had seen them. So instead she said rather lamely, Timothy, don't think about it anymore. When the time comes, we'll see how you are and then we'll decide what to do. The next morning at daybreak, she went to see the rats. She had never been in the rose bush before, never even really close to it. And now the nearer she got, the more nervous she became. No one had ever told her, nor as far as she knew, told any of the other animals to keep away from it. It was just something that you knew. The rats on Mr. Fitzgibbon's farm kept to themselves. One did not prowl into their domain. She had before coming out of the garden, looked around and carefully um, looked to be sure that Dragon was nowhere in sight. But even Dragon, though he would chase a rat up to the edge of the bush, would not follow him into that rose bush. The thorns, of course, helped to discourage trespassers. Mrs. Frisbee had never realized until that moment, standing next to it, how very big the bush was, how dense, how incredibly thorny. It was bigger than the tractor shed, and its branches were so densely intertwined that as small as she was, Mrs. Frisbee could find no easy way to crawl into it though she walked all the way around it looking. She remembered approximately where she had seen the rats go in, and she studied that part of the bush carefully. How had they done it? How did they get in? Then she saw that on one branch close to the ground, the thorns had been scraped off, about half an inch, just big enough for a handhold, was worn smooth. She put her hand on this and pushed timidly. The branch yielded easily, rather like a swinging door, and behind it, she saw a trail, a sort of a tunnel through the bush, wide enough so that she could walk into it without touching thorns on either side. When she went forward, she released the branch and it swung back silently into place behind her. She was inside the bush and it was dark. She walked forward peering into the dimness that followed the small trail which wound into a curving course toward the center of the bush, its earthen floor packed firm by the pressure of small feet. Then, straight ahead of her, she saw the entrance. She had expected, what, a round hole in the dirt, most likely, but certainly nothing like what she saw. First, a sizable clearing about five feet across had been cut from the center of the bush. Branches, Branches overhead had been cleared away too, not quite to the top of the bush, but almost, so that in the sunlight, so that the sunlight filtered through easily and soft moss grew on the ground. In the middle of this bright green cave rose a small mound, eight inches tall. And in the end was an arched entrance neatly lined with stone, like a small doorway without any door. Behind the entrance was a tunnel its floor, also lined with stones, led backward and downward. Beside the entranceway, looking at her with dark, 
unblinking eyes was the biggest rat she had ever seen.